and begin a sort of, as you say, the second portion of this study on how to study the Bible. And I would have you go with me again to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. I would read this verse once again. We began on the foundation verse of 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Nehemiah 8.8 8 tells us or gives us the method for studying. Nehemiah, Old Testament book. Chapter 8, verse 8. It's easy to remember that one. Nehemiah 8, 8. And the Bible tells me in this verse, you should have read it by now, should have found it by now. So they read in the book of, they read in the book of the law of, the, of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. These three Sections, this, this verse can be divided into three sections, which we call the method or the biblical method for studying the Bible. They read in the book of God distinctly, they gave the sense, and then caused them to understand the reading. Observation, interpretation, and application. Or you might say exposition. Explanation and application. That's the method to study in the Bible. So we've spent a, a few weeks on the first point, which is really observation. Um, what do you see in the text? And so we talked about um, the application of the principle of observation. We gave you an example of how we do that in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. I, I, we had a little, uh, one night, we had a little demonstration. As to how we can go through the verses of the verse, word by word, phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence, and study what's there. Observe, observe, observe. So we talked about how to read the Bible. How do you read the Bible? And we talked about all of this is part of observe, observing or exposition, finding what's there. What, do you, what's, what does the Bible, what is it saying? What do, what do I see here? What do I see? We also talked about what type of literature we're dealing with. Different, you know, the, the Bible is made up of different literary styles, and you know, law, poetry, and so forth. Prophecy. We talked about that uh, in the weeks before. So all of this came under the the heading, or should come under the heading of observation. What do you see when you read? And you need to learn to read the Bible slowly, and calmly, and meditatively. And allow, sometimes loudly to yourself. Because you want to observe what's there. You know, David said in Psalm 119 verse 18, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Open my eyes so I can see what's there. Do you see what's there? Do you know how to see what's there? Well, this deals with observation. They read in the book of the law of God distinctly. You have to begin by reading, but you cannot stop with just reading. You have to study. We have to study the Bible. So we talked a little bit about that, how we can learn to observe what's there. Watch for things that are repeated. Uh, watch for things that uh, are mentioned first. Um, watch you know, how, the, how the text deals with the particular subjects. Study, study, study the Word of God. So we observe, we observe, we observe. Now we come to the second part of this verse. The middle part says, it says, they read in the book of God distinctly and gave the sense. That's a very, very important part of Bible study. Giving the sense. In other words, you're asking now, not what do I see, but what does it say? What does this text say? They gave the sense. Now, the thing is, the Bible, the Bible is a book that can be understood. As a matter of fact, it's expected that you don't understand it. God didn't give a book to become a riddle <laughs> um, or a puzzle. The Bible is a revelation of God. It's a revelation of the heart of God. It's not a riddle. Some people say, oh, the Bible is so confusing. I don't, you know. The Bible is not a riddle. It's a revelation of God. 
It's God telling you what he's like. And he wants you and I to be like him. So the book that we have reveals God. And if you don't have a proper view of God, my friend, you won't have any, any, any inspiration to obey him. And the, the, the crisis in the world today is, is an incorrect view of God. An incorrect view of God. And um, an incorrect view of God will definitely result in incorrect lifestyles. So the Bible is a book that reveals God. And as I see God, and I begin to see his mind, how he thinks. This book tells me how God thinks. And God wants me to think like him. So Bible study is not, well, this is positive. I don't understand. And I understand there are certain texts in the scripture that might be definitely challenging to understand. No question about that. But as a whole, the Bible is not a puzzle. The Bible is a revelation. The Bible is not, um, it, it's profitable. It's not puzzling. It's, you know, you know, as a matter of fact, we read that in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. For doctrine, that means to tell you what is right. For doctrine, what's the next one? For reproof, for instruction in righteousness. Let's read it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says all scripture, turn with me quickly, 2 Timothy 3, 16. I want us to look at it again. We have read that text many times, but look at it again. To reveal that the Bible is something that you and I can understand. It's not just preachers and Sunday school teachers that can understand the Bible. Every one of us can understand the Bible. Look with me quickly at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine. Doctrine tells us what is right. Reproof tells us what is not right. Correction tells us what, how to get it right. Instruction in righteousness tells us how to keep it right. So there could be no right living without Bible, an understanding of the Bible. So don't you ever let people fool you thinking the Bible is not possible to be understood. It's this mysterious book that only special people can understand it. That's... That's not so, friends. The Bible is God's love letter to you. And I guarantee if somebody writes your love letter and your lover writes your love letter, your husband or wife, or your fiancé, boyfriend, girlfriend writes your love letter, believe me, you would want to read that over and over and over again because you know you can understand it. And by reading the words in the letter, you get to understand what your lover is thinking. Hey, the Bible is God's love letter. Don't treat the Bible as some mysterious book that's only for special people to understand. God wants you to get it. God wants, to, God wants you to respond to his love letter. So it's, it's, it's not a puzzle. It's, it's profitable. Get, keep that in your heart as we deal with Bible interpretation. It can be understood. It's not a riddle. Okay? Now, practical as a matter of fact, practical application of the Bible is impossible if you have not made proper interpretation. Let me say that again. Why is it that, why is it that, we, that people hear the Bible so much and never really do it? Um, why is it we hear so much and never really do? Do you know that the problem stems from the lack of proper interpretation? We don't really interpret that this, that this is God's word. We don't really believe that. So here's the deal. Here, look at it. Look at Psalm 119 verse 34. Here's what David said. And you know Psalm 119 is a chapter that is all about the scriptures. Look at Psalm 119 verse number 34. Um, <laughs> uh, the, that's amazing. The scripture is so sweet. It's applicable. It's real. It's not a puzzle. It's, it's given to be applied for doctrine Correction, instruction, and righteousness. Reproof and so forth. Correction, instruction, and righteousness. But look with me at Psalm 119, verse 34. 
The psalmist David, and of course the longest chapter in the Bible is about the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 34. And I read. David said this. Give me what? Understanding. See, I don't just want to read it. I want to understand it. And I shall keep thy law. So tell me, when will he keep the law of God? When, he, when will he be obedient? When he understands it. Give me understanding that I may keep thy law, yea, I shall observe it with my whole if I could, if I, if I, if I interpret the Bible properly, it would lead to application. So observation, interpretation. That's where we begin tonight. But we're not going to finish tonight because there's a few things I want to share with you on how to properly interpret the Bible. Remember, there could be no application, no proper application without proper interpretation. What does this mean? And you notice in the scripture, in Nehemiah 8.8, 8, they read in the book of God distinctly. And what did they do? They gave the sense. And after they gave the sense, what did they do? What did they do after they get them to, to understand it? It says right here in the text that they got them to understand the text. They gave the sense. And so the Bible reveals that I cannot properly interpret the Bible, um, apply the Bible, until I've made proper interpretation of the Bible. Give me understanding. Now, you say, Pastor, how do I know what this thing is saying? Because you find some Christians would say one thing about the Bible and another person says it's something completely opposite about the same text. And that's why we have all this religious confusion today. How do you know what the Bible is saying? How, do you, how can you rightly interpret? Now, the first thing you need to understand, there's a principle, there's a principle in, in Bible interpretation, and that principle is this. The meaning of the text is not determined by your subjective thoughts. It's not what you read into this. But the meaning of the text is determined by God's unchanging objective truth. So you can't sit on there and, you know, well, this is what I think I see here. The question is, what has God said? I'm reading through Jeremiah again, and I'm, reading, I'm realizing how, how relevant Jeremiah is to the time in which we live. Because during the time of Jeremiah, there were some prophets that were saying, thus said the Lord. But what they said after that? was not what God said. So God says, Jeremiah, I want you to preach to these prophets and tell them, don't you say, thus said the Lord, and then tell a dream or tell something else. If you say, thus said the Lord, what you say after that must be what God says. How do you interpret the Bible? Keep this in your mind. The meaning of a text is not determined by your or my subjective thoughts, but by God's objective, unchanging truth. Proper Bible interpretation is finding God's thoughts and thinking them after him. What does the text say? Not what am I reading into, into the text. That's, we use that in theology. We use the terminology exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis is a term we use in, in homiletics to teach the young preachers that you read out of the text, what's there, not eisegesis or read into the text what you think about it. The text is supposed to change your thoughts, not your thoughts change the text. That's why the Bible says, how do you get the scripture? There must be precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Because the Bible is, the Bible itself, it's its own interpreter. Clear passages explain obscure passages. So if you read a passage here that seems obscure, and it seems like a puzzle, there is always a text somewhere else in the Bible that explains it. So that's why you have two systems on the earth today. Some people say you're saved by faith. Some people say you're saved by works. Because one of them read in Romans where it says we are saved by faith. 
And another one in read in James that says we're saved by works. Which one is true? Uh, is the Bible contradicting itself? Well, the Bible never contradicts itself because God cannot contradict himself. So how do you, how, how do you solve that? You read what Romans says and you read what uh, that James says and then you put what Rejo, uh, uh, Paul and James says together with what the rest of the scripture says about salvation. And you come to find this out. You come to find out that Paul is talking about salvation from the perspective of God. Faith saves because God alone can see faith. James is looking at salvation from the human perspective. And James says, you say by works. It doesn't mean you get born again by works. It just means that the evidence of your salvation is proven by the works. That's why you find the word in the text, ye see, Y-E, ye see, brethren. Ye see, that means you people, you can only see works, but God sees faith. So a man is saved by faith without works. Because, you know, Romans tells us clearly, if it's faith, it's faith. If it's works, it's works. It can't be by faith and works. So when you study the Bible, you realize, whoa, 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 these are two different perspectives. And then you read another text that says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So does that mean I have to work for my salvation? No. You understand? It says, work out your salvation, for it is God that worketh in you. So you learn, hey, God worked salvation in me by faith. I need to work that out. I need to live like a Christian. So you solve seemingly contradictory problems. By letting the plain text explain the obscure text. But always remember this. The mind of God is revealed in the word of God. And we are here to get, to get God's thoughts and think God's thoughts after him. That is Bible interpretation. And you can never apply the scripture. And I could never properly apply the scripture until I have understood the scripture. Until I have realized that this is not man's thoughts. These are God's thoughts. And do you know that no human being can actually motivate people to live God's thoughts if those persons have not by themselves accepted God's thoughts? It's not eisegesis. It's exegesis. Reading out what God has written in. Now turn to me quickly to a text in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 16, and then we're going to go to Acts 8, and I'll be done. Interpreting the Bible is key to applying the Bible. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 16. We often use this scripture to speak of heaven, but the context is not really about heaven. You could apply it, but. If you're going to get the meaning of the text, and every text has one meaning. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says, pay attention to these words. God's thoughts. Remember, when you open the scripture, you're dealing with God's thoughts. God's words. God's words. But as it is written, I have not seen nor a heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things. That's an interesting word right there. The things which God had prepared for them that love him. You say, oh, that's talking about heaven. Well, indeed, God has prepared heaven for those who are saved. Praise the Lord for that. But the context is not really talking about heaven. Notice with me. He says, I have not seen. That means human eye. Human ear has not heard or discovered. Neither it's entered into human heart. It did, in other words, God's thoughts does not come from man. But, look at verse 10. God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. What has God revealed? The things that eye has not seen and the things that eye has not heard and the things that have not entered into the heart of man. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. How does God reveal his thoughts? By his spirit. For the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now look at your text. Look at your text. I know you're looking, praise the Lord, for that. I see the master down, so that's great. 
the things the Spirit of God has revealed. It says, reveal the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Why? That we might what? Know the things that are freely given to us of God. It's not heaven yet, brothers and sisters. I know we love to talk about heaven, but get the context. He's saying there are some things that God has revealed and he has, he has utilized the inspiration of the scriptures, the prophets and all of that to give us those things. But only people who have the Holy Spirit in them can discern those things. Let's go on. Which things also we speak, not with words, which what? Man's wisdom. A had not seen, I had not seen, uh, A have not uh, heard, I has not seen, and so forth. Which things also we speak, not with the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing, that's a tremendous word, spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, that's the same guy up here with the A and the I that has not heard on the heart that has not been able to perceive and receive the things. And by the way, the word things in that text is the Greek word logos. <laughs> the word of God. Check it out. In other words, God is saying, the unsaved man did not get the word of God and he cannot get the word of God until he has the spirit of God in him. God will give him sufficient light to get saved. But after that, my friend, before that, there is no word. He cannot understand the things of the spirit of God. Let's read it. Verse 14. But the natural man, who is a natural man, an unsaved man, receive it not the what? There is it again, the words of God. The things of the spirit of God, for they are what? Fool foolishness. Can you imagine somebody thinking God's love letter, God's love words are foolishness, is foolishness? What would make a man do that? His natural heart. And the Bible talks about people who wrestle with the scripture to their own destruction. You know that they're trying to explain scripture, but they have not the Holy Ghost inside of them. That's a frustrating thing. A man trying to explain text, but the author of the text is not in him. He's natural. And he's looking at things strictly from the natural. And he's interpreting the word of God from the natural perspective. And every time he does that, he will be wrong. Let's finish. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness of them. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned, spiritually discovered. And I believe that's sometimes the answer to a lot of resistance to Scripture today. You know? There might be people that we think are saved, they're not. The natural things appeal to them better than the things of the Spirit. But the Bible tells me that the Spirit of God makes the Word of God, the things of God, applicable to the Christian. Look, look at verse 15. But he that is spiritual, that's talking about the saved man. So we have the natural man and the spiritual man. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. You can't figure out a Christian. You can't figure out a Christian. Some people marvel that a Christian would actually turn down big jobs, big opportunities to make money in the world and humble themselves and serve God in a pulpit or on a mission field. They wonder how, the, how, how, the, how you factor that in. You can't figure that out because he's a Christian. Oh, so much talent wasted. You, tell, you hear them say, oh, so much talent wasted. Why did he have to go into religious life, as they think, you know? Oh, he's such a brilliant, she's such a brilliant curse. Oh, how, why did they just waste such talent? They have no clue that a human being that has the spirit of God inside of them is on a completely different plane. You can't judge them. Let's finish this. 
For who had known the mind of, look at that, for who had known the mind of the Lord, that, we, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ, the text. And the mind of Christ, the spirit in us. My friend, brothers and sisters. It should bother somebody. It should worry them if the text doesn't seem to be appealing. Do you hear me? It should, it, should, it should concern you if the text doesn't seem appealing. Because the things, of the, the things of God he has revealed to us by his spirit. And the spirit searches all things. The deep things of God. Logos. The spirit searches the deep words of God. And because that person is a spiritual person, that means they're saved. There is an affinity to the words of God. There is a desire to understand it so that they can apply it. But the carelessness in the world today and the carelessness in most churches today with respect to the text is a telling sign that either some people are really, really carnal or they need the author in their hearts. There is one thing you can test. When you got saved, there is one thing you can test, and I can test. There was a change in your attitude to this book. Listen, you didn't know it. You probably still don't know a whole lot of scripture, but you know a lot more now. But even though you were raised in church and you memorized scripture, I don't know about you, you, memor you had a Bible from the time you were a kid, and you had many, many scriptures memorized, but the day you got saved, all of that scripture take, took on a different you took a different attitude towards that text. That book became something to you. You know why? Because that is how God revealed the things of God. The world cannot understand that. And they cannot judge a Christian. A Christian is on a different plane because he's dealing with different thoughts. He's dealing with the thoughts of God. And the world is contrary to God. In every sense of the word. Every sense of the word. And I say this and I close. I, know, I don't have time to get into Acts. I'll deal with it next time. How, uh, how proper interpretation of the scripture led to the reaching of Africa for Christ. Philip and the eunuch. Acts chapter 8. Remember he, he asked him, Understandest thou what thou readest? And you know what he said? What he said? How can I accept some man guide me? The boy was reading from the whole book of Isaiah. He was even reading about Christ and the sacrifice of Christ. He's wounded for a transgression. He's bruised for iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He's reading scripture. Then he says to Philip, is that talking about another man? Who is this talking about? He couldn't understand. And Philip, praise God. Philip who had the Holy Ghost inside of him was able to interpret that scripture for that Ethiopian eunuch. And when he got to understand it, he got saved. And the moment the boy got saved, he was ready to obey Christ. He said, hey, there's water anywhere wrong here, guys. I am ready to serve. I don't even want to wait until I get back to Ethiopia. I want to get it right. I want to get it done right now. That's what the scripture does, my friend. And this man who was religious was lost. He was worshiping but lost. He was rich but lost. All of a sudden he came to a point where he understood the scriptures. The spirit of God used the man of God and gave the interpretation. He says, this is talking about Jesus. The Bible says, Philip began at the same scripture and preached unto him, Jesus. That's why the scripture must be rightly interpreted because every scripture leads you to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Wherever you go, Genesis, Revelation, X, I don't care where you go. It will all take you back to Jesus. He's going to show you Jesus. And you're going to see Jesus, your lover, your savior, your friend. And my friend, if there is no change in your attitude to this blessed book, make your call in the election show. Because something happens. In your heart. I cannot, I, I mean, I cannot explain it. You know because you got saved. 
it, it just, you know, you, proper interpretation played a role in reaching Africa for Christ. That guy went back to Africa and started some great churches over there. All because in his chariot, he came to an understanding of the word of God. Interpretation is critical to application. May the Lord help us to rightly interpret the word of God. And whenever you find your desire waning for the scripture, guess what stories it up again? Just reading the scripture. You ever been there? Sometimes you feel like you don't want to read. There's a laziness to get the things of God. And you know what stirs that again? The scripture itself. Just, just start reading it. Just start reading it. Just start reading it. And the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. The word produces faith. So the problem is the, when fear steps in, you got to pick up more scriptures and run that fear out of your life. Because faith runs fear out. But faith comes by reading, hearing the word of God. So do you know how to rightly interpret the scripture? And if you have interpreted, I guarantee you, if you have interpreted it properly, it leads to application. This is the next point in scripture study. So there's observation. What does it, what, what is here? What is here? What is here? Praise the Lord. I observe, I observe, I observe. But the next question is, what does it mean? And then the last question is, how do I live it? How does that apply to me right now? The Ethiopian eunuch, the moment that a man heard that he was a sinner and that he needed to be saved, he was born again, trusted Christ. Every sinner who dies and goes to hell is because they lack an understanding of the scripture. They don't really believe God. They don't really believe God. You know, people say, God's not going to put anybody in hell. God's too loving to do that. Oh, he's a loving God. Yes, he's certainly a loving God. You know why they say that? They don't understand God. They think God is some kind of sugar daddy. They don't understand the love and the wrath of God. All in the same person. In full. It's not like God is partially love and partially. No, no, no. God is all love and yet that love hates sin. The knowledge of the holy. As A.W. Tozer calls it in his book. The knowledge of the holy the problem today. We don't know him. And the reason we don't know him is because we don't know his thoughts. God is saying, think my thoughts after me. The only way to success is to think my thoughts after me. Because I guarantee you, as you step out here, Satan is going to fill you with his thoughts. He's going to fill me with his thoughts so I could do his business. And I close with this, as one man said, I don't remember the quote, I don't remember to quote it exactly. I don't remember the guy's name anyway. But he was saying, when Satan approached Eve in the Garden of Eden, he never told her that he wanted him to be her master. He didn't tell her anything about that. What he did was, he, he, he encouraged her to depend on self. You could be a God. Just, just you know. Depend on yourself. And do you know that the moment time Eve decided to. Exercise self will. She became the servant of Satan. That's what Satan works. He doesn't come and tell you I want to be a master. I want to be a boss. He doesn't do that. He says, I want you to self-assert. I want you to look out for self. I want you to serve self. And once you serve self, you become his, his servant. You don't realize that you have submitted your, your, your life. You submitted your allegiance to Satan as master. So the greatest problem in the world is not Satan so much in it. It's self. The word of God takes me away from self to begin to think God's thoughts. And as I follow God's thoughts, I become God's servant. He's my master. He's my master. Okay? 
So it's not about, oh, the devil coming and say, hey, I want you to be my servant. You what? You my slave. No, no, he doesn't come like that. All he comes with is the deceptive word. Just look out for yourself. Manage yourself. Self-will is the greatest hindrance to God's will. And God's will is in in God's word. So what do I do? The more I get into this book, the more self can be defeated, dethroned, die, devalued. And Christ takes control. So now it becomes a matter of masters. So Jesus said you cannot serve two of them. You either love one, and guess the one you love is the one you're studying and you're reading his stories. Or you hate the other. You cannot serve two. And Satan says, I, I really want you to serve me, but I will not come out and tell you, serve me, because you'll say, oh, devil, you want me to serve you? Ha, I don't know you. <laughs> no, 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 devil. He wouldn't do that. He, he's smarter than that. He'll say, ah, do you know, you could actually run your life without God. You could manage this thing on your own. That's essentially what he was telling Eve. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You don't have to stress about submitting to this heavenly father. You just be your own God. Just be your own God. And Eve bought that hook. She took that and she, and she grabbed that. Satan is laughing in the back down in glee. Ha, now I am your master. So my greatest challenge and your greatest challenge, brothers and sisters, is to get God's thoughts to deliver me from the tyranny of the enemy. Satan is a hard taskmaster. He's wicked and malicious. And he doesn't show up as the devil in horns and red tail and fork and all that stuff. You know? He just comes and says, <laughs> just, just do it yourself. Do it yourself. And that's essentially what he told Jesus in the wilderness. I mean, you don't have to wait on the master's, you don't have to wait on the father's timetable. Just, you're hungry, just take matters in your hand and turn these stones into bread. Just, 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 that's just one little moment. Jesus said, it is written. If you don't know God's thoughts, you can't throw it back at the devil. Because the first thing he would question to get you and me to submit to his plan, he charges the word of God. Because the first question in the Bible was a question about what's written. Yea, hath God said. That was it. As the devil raised one question on the word of God, the next question was, okay, if God didn't say, then you can say. Eve bought that. She turned to her husband. She said, darling, <laughs> since I had this fruit, be a God with me. We'll be gods together. Human race plunged into sin. All because our first, our four parents chose self rather than God. And so redemption now, redemption, and I didn't mean to say this one, but redemption, when Christ comes in me and in you, and he puts his nature in you, guess what he puts in there? A selfless, the selfless Jesus, the self-sacrificing Jesus, to make you and me self-sacrificing. So he says, hey, I'll tell you what to do with, I'll tell you what to do with, with self. Every day you put him up on that cross and kill him. How do you kill him? You replace his thoughts with my thoughts. There's a whole lot of worldly thinking in the church today. Because God's word is not preeminent. May God help us, church. To put his thoughts in our thinking cap, as we say. Think like God. The Bible is not a puzzle. It's a revelation to make you think like Christ. Every head bowed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. 
I know there is there's just so much we can say concerning this matter of the challenge we have of having your thoughts conquer our own self-willed thoughts. I pray that you would forgive us where we have allowed ourselves to become servants of the enemy rather than servants of God. And we see countless examples in the Bible how men willingly or unwillingly submitted themselves to another master because they failed to apply your thoughts. Deliver us from the greatest deception on the planet, the deception of self. We may conquer self with the thoughts of God. In Jesus' name.